Please keep your Bibles open at 1 John chapter 3. We are working our way through the epistle of 1 John and today we will uh, study chapter 3. Uh, before we begin, let me uh, pray. Gracious and uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. We thank you for your mercies and grace. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your word and uh, Pray that as we come to study your word, uh, help us and give us wisdom, understanding and also help us to apply it in our lives. Also pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach your word faithfully for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Most of you uh, must have heard uh, of a test called duck test. It uh, goes something like this. If it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, if it quakes like a duck, then probably it is a duck. It is a powerful uh, test, though it looks very simple. And John employs that test here in chapter 3 to distinguish uh, between who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. So what John says is that if a person says that he is a Christian, if he looks like a Christian, if he talks like a Christian, if he walks like a Christian also, and also loves like Christ, then probably he is a Christian. But on the other hand, if a person says that he is a Christian, but does not walk like a Christian, but walks like the devil, then probably he is not a child of God. You must have heard the phrase, like father, like son, like mother, like daughter. So a son is expected to resemble in character and nature like his parent. And similarly, a daughter is expected to resemble in character and nature like a mom. And what John is writing here is that if you are a child of God, then you are to resemble like the true and living God. So let's pick up at verse 29. He says that if you know that he is righteous, so he's saying that God is righteous. So if the father is righteous, then the expectation is that the child must also be righteous. Now, God defines what righteousness is. We, we don't define what righteousness is. God defines what is right and wrong. And let's look further. He says in verse 29 that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. So he's not saying that if you do right, you will be a child of God or you will become a child of God. He's not saying that if you do right, you will be saved. But he's saying that if you are a child of God, if you are born again, if you are born of him, then your nature and your conduct will reflect that thing. And then John goes on further in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And here, in a sense, John is... And this spontaneously, he is kind of rejoicing, he is in wonder at the love of Father, the love that this Father has lavished on us. And how has this Father lavished his love on us? He has called us his children. But more than that, he has lavished his love, this extravagant love, this overflowing love, this abundant love by giving us his Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And this is the love of the Father, which is bountiful, which is marvelous, which is so rich. And this love that God has for us, and in that love he calls us his children. What a privilege it is. To be called the child of God. And it is not we who choose to be his children. It is God himself who chooses. It is God himself who adopts us into his family. And calls us his child. So this is a gift 
This is not something that you can achieve, that is not something that you can earn. And at the same time, it's not something that you can cancel it or revoke it. And what a marvelous thing this is, that the father should call as his child. This love that he has lavished on us. And not only does he call us his children, but it says here in verse 1 that that is what we are. So this is a status, this is a new status that is given to us, to those who are born of God, to those who have this spiritual new birth experience. And this is our status now. We are his children. And what a marvelous thing And this is, that he calls us the worst of sinners, you and me. He calls us his children. We are loved by him. And John goes on further here and he tells us how to distinguish who a child of God is and who a child of devil is. Because at the time John was writing this epistle, there were many people, the people who called themselves Gnostics, these were the people who had invaded the church and they were calling themselves Christians. But they were living a life of sin. They were talking like Christian, but walking like the devil. And so John writes this episode to warn us and also to challenge these Gnostics. And so he gives a test here. A test of how to identify who a child of God is. And if you look at verse 10, he summarizes it this way. He says that this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So John gives us two identifying markers to identify who a child of God is. And the first one is, he says, the one who does what is right or acts rightly and does not continue in sin. And the second one is the one who loves his brother and sister. Let's look at the first identifying marker. So one who acts rightly and picking at verse 5 is at verse 6 John says that no one who lives in him keeps on sinning so John is saying that no one who lives in him that is no one who is calls himself the child of God continues to keep on sinning John is not talking about uh, sinless perfection He's saying that a child of God cannot continue, continue to live in sin. So the lifestyle of children of God cannot be characterized by sin. Sin cannot be a habitual thing. What John says here is very clear. It's not saying that you cannot sin or you will not sin as a child of God. But he's saying that you cannot continue in sin. You cannot keep on sinning. So the child of God cannot have this habit of sinning. And some of you may be wondering and thinking that I struggle with sin, I struggle with lust, I struggle with envy, I struggle with lying, I struggle with pornography, I struggle with jealousy, with gossip. Does that make me a not a child of God? Am I not a Christian? But that is not what John is saying here. He's saying that that should not be your lifestyle, that should not be what characterizes you. John clearly tells us that you cannot live or 
keep on sinning that is what is an important thing here and you say what happens when i'm sinning why am i sinning sometimes he also give excuse and say that it's not in my control i i try but look at look at what john writes here he says that the son of man appeared if you look at very carefully here he says the son of man appeared to destroy the works of the devil in verse 8 it says that the reason the son of god appeared was to destroy the devil's work so the son of god the jesus christ appeared and the reason that he appeared was to destroy this work of the devil and he adds more and says that in verse if you look at carefully at verse 5 he says but you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins so christ jesus appeared to take away our sins not only our sins but also the consequences of this sin jesus came he defeated death he defeated the enemy on the cross and now the enemy has no power over the child of god he has been defeated already and christ has done that work on the cross and now you cannot continue to sin you cannot give this excuse that i try but i continue in sin because the power of the devil has been completely shattered and broken on that cross so john says that you can't make sinning a habit you can't have this as a lifestyle but we know that the scriptures recognize that we as children of god will sin occasionally and few weeks back pastor eugen preached from 1 john chapter 1 and verse 9 he says that if we confess our sins he is faithful and just so here there's a provision god knows that we as children of god will sin and so he says that if we sin we can come into his presence to confess and he will forgive us and also lord jesus taught his disciples the lord's prayer where there is a daily provision of confession of sin forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us but john reminds us that we cannot continue to keep on sinning as a child of god we cannot sin and he points us that in verse 8 he says that the one who does what is sinful is of the devil so when we sin actually we are taking part in the scheme of the devil we are actually aligning ourselves with the devil but as jesus appeared to destroy the works of the devil if you are children of god we are to be on the side of jesus not on the side of the devil so when we sin in a sense we are aligning with the devil we are promoting his cause and jesus has already dealt with our sins he has paid the price for our sins on that cross and not only paying that price for the sins but also he has destroyed that work of the devil that power that devil had has been completely shattered and destroyed the devil has no more hold on children of god and john reminds us he says that here very clearly that as the children of god we cannot sin and the reason that he gives his in verse 9 he says that no one who is born of god will continue to sin because god's seed remains in them so god's seed is that the holy spirit remains in us so when you are born again when you have this new birth experience god gives this gift of the holy spirit this seed remains in you as a child of god and the scriptures remind us clearly 
that we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit resides in us. So as a child of God, as the Holy Spirit residing in us, we cannot continue in this habit of sinning, this lifestyle of sinning. And this Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is the helper, is the advocate, is the counselor who is given to us to guide us, to help us, to bring conviction of sin. And this seed, the Holy Spirit, helps us to abide in Him, to walk in light and not to walk in darkness. Now if Jesus has dealt with you and my sins, if Jesus has broken the power of the devil on the cross, how can we any longer continue living in sin? How can we say that we are helpless? How can we give excuse for continuing to remain and have that lifestyle of sin? You may say nobody is watching me. I can do whatever I want, but God is watching you. Your conduct at your workplace, your conduct at your university, at your college, reflects whether you're a son or child of God or whether you're a child of the devil. If you are the child of God, you will resemble the character and the nature of God. For he is righteous. He is perfectly holy and perfectly pure. And you cannot continue to oppose him by living in that life of sin. Parents, let me ask you this thing. Does it bother you how your child behaves? Of course it does. Because your child reflects you. Because your child is a resemblance of you. And people will look at your child and say, this is what the nature of the parents is. And similarly, if we are the children of God, it does matter how we live. It does matter how we conduct ourselves. And let's look at the second identifying uh, mark of a child of God. And it says that the second identifying mark of a child of God is his love for his brother and sister. And love is such an important theme in the book of John and in the, in the letter of John. And John here gives two examples of love. One is positive and one is negative. So he first talks about the negative example. He speaks about Cain. He says, do not be like Cain who murdered his own brother because his actions were evil, whereas his brother Abel's actions were righteous. So if you see here again a clear distinction. The actions of Cain were evil. His acts were wicked whereas the actions of his brother were righteous. And you may say, but I'm not like Cain, I won't murder anybody. But if you look, John goes on further in verse 15. He says that anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. So saying not only the physical act of killing, but he's saying even if you hate your brother, it is equivalent to murdering him. Even your thoughts, your intentions matters. We, by our hatred towards people we don't like, we murder them by lying, by gossiping about the person, we can easily ruin their reputation. That is the same thing as murdering or hatred. There must have been many occasions in your life when you did not want to talk to a person or 
सेम फेस टू फेस एज यू वॉक्स इन टू द रूम यू जस्ट लीव अवे मेनी टाइम्स दे इज अ डीप हेटरेड इन द हार्ट यू लुक एट दैट पर्सन यू हेट एंड यू वॉन्ट टू सिट एट द डिफरेंट कॉर्नर इन द रूम and hatred is what is not a character that a child of god should have john gives one more example of love he says what love should be he looks at jesus he says this is how we know what love is jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters so he looks at this perfect example of love jesus christ who died on the cross who laid his life so this is the example of sacrificial love whereas the example of cain is he his actions resulted in murder of someone killing of someone the hate is in a sense negative it leads you to harm somebody even to the point of killing them on the contrary love is positive it leads you to do good for someone even to the point of giving your own life now we are meant to imitate we are meant to follow the example of jesus by laying down our lives but the very rare occasions when we'll be required to lay down our lives but he gives a practical example of what love means if you look at verse 17 it says if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them how can the love of god be in that person so john says here that if you have a material possession but you don't care about a brother or sister who is struggling how can they be love in you now you may say i am a poor university student you may say i am a person i have a young family i don't have enough money but are you willing to sacrifice are you willing to not spend that money on the expensive mobile phone or that expensive beauty care or that expensive beauty products are you willing to let go of spending money on your coffee each day or going out dining each day and use that money to help those who are in need to help those who are struggling So we see a clear contrast here. We see the example of Cain and we see example of Christ. We see one is filled with hatred and one who is filled with love. And John here he makes love as a command. And if we look at verse 23 he says and this is his command to believe in the name of his son. Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us so love is not optional here it is actually a command so we are meant to love our brothers and sisters in Christ if you say that we are children of god and this is a divine command to love now of we loving the world and the things in the world more than the children of god are we devoted to the things of this world or are we devoted to loving our brother and sister and loving our brother and sister helping them in their need is not just once in a lifetime or once in a year thing it's not like christmas just help them once in a year it is a lifelong discipline and love challenges us because 
we have to give he says that not just in words but in actions our love has to be displayed john here he says this love is not optional love is actually a command and if you look at verse 23 he says that this is his command to believe in the name of his son jesus christ and to love one another as he commanded us so it is not optional love is a command here and we are to love like christ loved the real love is to love like god like jesus loved and he, the greatest and the highest desire is to see that somebody the one we love comes to know jesus that is the greatest love it's not saying that a person has the material possessions but the greatest good is to see that the one we love comes to know jesus and if today today you are the one who does not know jesus and today if you are the one who cannot call yourself the child of god if you have not put your trust in christ jesus let me tell you this is a wonderful news for you the kingdom of god has come god in a sense has opened his office here on earth and today if you confess your sins today if you repent of your wrong doings today if you put your trust in christ jesus he is willing to forgive he is willing to wash away your sins and give you this gift of eternal life and adopt you into his family and to call you the child of god but if you have already put your trust in christ jesus if you call yourself the child of god if you have received this eternal gift but if you are struggling in your sin if you have this times in your life where you yield to temptation let me encourage you it says that god is greater than your heart if your heart is condemning you it says that god is greater than your heart god not only knows your actions but also knows what's in your heart and god love in a sense god loves you and your status as a child of god does not depend and how you feel your status depends on god and his promises for you and for me let us purify ourselves as the scripture reminds us there is all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure and we purify ourselves by confessing our sins by coming into his presence each day and the scriptures remind us blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see god and the scriptures remind us here that we shall see him and be like him so on that day we shall see him and as christ jesus is the first fruit of resurrection we too will be raised and will have that glorious resurrected bodies and as we live let us not continue to live in sin let us not make it a lifestyle but let us live as children of god because that is what we are amen